Hi everyone, I'm Harv, Ian Harvey, founder of Collective Intelligence, and this is Stuff That Matters Now. Hey, welcome back everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I am in Wellington today with newly minted author, Alina Siegfried. Good morning, Alina. Mm, morning, I have. How are you doing? I'm I'm well. Yes. You're well. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Alina is many things, as it turns out. Alina is also a poet, mm-hmm. a slam poet, a systems change thinker, and hopefully a systems change doer. <laughs> yes, an advocate. Let's say in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, um, Alina, thank you for this interview. And so Alina has just written this book. It's uh, freshly printed, a future untold, which I'm holding here, which I have uh, have actually read. Mm. And it's now been signed uh, by Alina. Um, and interesting, I confess to Alina before we had this that when the book came through. I started, I thought, right, this is my homework. I need to read this before I interview Alina. I thought, oh, okay, homework. And normally when I've got homework, I sort of got to do it. <laughs> and so I sat down and thought, right, you can do this. And then bugger me, I actually enjoyed the book, Alina. <laughs> what a surprise. Well done. What a surprise. Yeah, wow. and I stopped reading it fast as homework. And I only just finished reading the last chapter this morning, mm. so it was nice and fresh in my mind. We're savouring the last bite. Yeah, and look, congratulations. It's a really, really good book. It's bloody interesting, and there's some really good thinking in there. Thanks, half. Mm. And the surprise to me, big surprise, is, God, you and I think alike. Do that's, we just? <laughs> that's spooky. You just, you just are a lot more eloquent. Yeah. <laughs> So, right. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it is a, is, and that is going to be the focus of mm-hmm. the podcast today. What was the motivation for reading, for writing this? Alina? Okay, so, um, so I'll read you the subtitle because then you'll know what the book's about. I'll hold it up, shall I? <laughs> yeah, I'll hold it, yeah, yeah, hold it so I can read it. I, I forget. <laughs> the book is A Future Untold, The Power of Story to Transform the World and Ourselves. And so what inspired me to write it is, um, oh, I've been, you know, I've done a lot of things in my career. I've had a squiggly line career through environmental advocacy. I did district planning in the Rangatiki, actually. Did you? Yes. Yeah, I know that's your patch. <laughs> um, and uh, worked in politics for a few years here in New Zealand. I was, yeah, I was over in the Canadian prairies for a while. I um, have done you know, crowdfunding and software startups and um, more recently worked with the uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, of which you were a fellow. And um, the thread throughout all of this was that I, um, you know, traditionally you would say I worked in, in roles that required an element of communications. But for me it was always storytelling. Um, basically you're telling um Telling interesting stories, telling your stories, framing them the way that you want to for whatever message that you're going to get across, and that was particularly, you know, um, top of mind when I worked um, in politics. And um, and everybody tells stories in slightly different ways, and it, um, I think, probably the Edmonton Fellowship experience um, was where I cut my teeth in real systems change and people getting together from very different fields. And learning from each other, and um, and realizing how much um, all of our systems that we've built as humans, collect- I say we, I mean humans collectively, um, are built on stories, on narratives about how we understand the wor- the way the world is. And when I was reading the book, and you framed it up around. Um, the myth, mm. right? And today, the myth means such and such, but the myth previously had a different meaning or a different connotation, mm. which I had forgotten. Mm-hmm. So we see myths now as a bad thing, yeah. But in fact, its origin is different, isn't it? 
Yeah, so myth these days has become synonymous with, you know, lies or it's it's used to attack or, um, you know, downplay something. Climate change is a myth. Trickle-down economics is a myth. This is a myth. Um, whereas originally, um, you know, the word, the word was a, a, a seed of truth, of human truth that was wrapped up in a story to be able to communicate it. You know, think of like... Of, of early humans, how they made sense of the world. They had these sort of seeds of truth in the middle, but um, but they made up stories and to, to communicate that. And... and that made me feel really uncomfortable, Alina, because I love stories. Hmm. And I'm, I thought, I, I have stories I tell, and I think, I'm not even sure if they're true. <laughs> right? As in, yeah. I think they're true. I tell the story as though it's true, yep. and I thought, fuck, you know what, I think I've made this up. As you, in, you, you might well have. <laughs> you know, there's psychology research that that is around our memory and the things that happened, and this one thing that happened to that guy over there, and you, and then, like, your memory distorts it, and you're like, oh, that happened to me, but, but we were in, in, no, we weren't there, we were at this other place, and when that happened. Our memory is a terrible, terrible, uh, you know, histories of the past. And and that, that just set off all sorts of stuff inside me going, oh, my God, my stories, you know, which I am very fond of, right, because they tell the story of my life. And I think, I'm not sure, they, I'm not sure how true they are. But Does it matter? Well, and that's the question I was going to put to you. Does it matter? Mm. Because the story, when I tell the story, I tell the story about what's important to me, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because often, you know, facts are really boring sometimes, <laughs> right? Yeah. But when you wrap it around what, and I know and I know that people can go to the same event and tell totally different stories about the same event. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. We also apply our subjective lenses to any given situation. And I, I think if you're telling a story and you're wondering, is that true? Then, you know, ask yourself, what's the purpose of me telling this story? And that's what triggered for me. I go, why is this story important to me? Mm. Right? Why is this important to me? Why am I telling it this way? And so that was one of the things, the great gifts of reading this book for me, was that uh, it made me more conscious of my stories and then thinking, am I doing a good enough job with the stories? Do they need to be told in a different way? And do I need to change? Because I thought, okay, I can actually mould these stories. I, I don't, yeah. So there was, a, there was a little bit of a, no, not a guilt, maybe guilt, but of a, oh, crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then there was the other bit of going, oh, yeah, this gives me licence as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I say straight up right at the front of the book, you know, um, there might be times in this book where I challenge you or you're a little bit uncomfortable with what I'm saying, and that's okay. And I invite you to embrace that because, you know, it's it's only through being uncomfortable and sitting in places of discomfort that we actually grow together. And I, yeah, so the, the yeah, so, so I, was, I was ready for the challenges, but I didn't. I was surprised what the challenge was, the big challenge for me. Mm. And the rest of it, I was going, I actually agreed with you with a lot of stuff. And mm-hmm. That's spooky. Because you're a bit weird and I'm not weird. <laughs> you're the weirdest person I know, half. <laughs> so I was just like, ooh. Um, the, what was the, what were you wanting to achieve by writing the book? Yeah, I think... I think my primary objective was to help people realise just how much the role of story or narrative shapes our lives and our understandings of the way things are. You know, it's a our global economic system is built upon a narrative that, you know, growth is good, companies get bigger, they employ people and everybody is happy. Now, that's a narrative that isn't working for a hell of a lot of people around the world and has, um, you know, paved the way for us to externalise so many costs to the natural environment. But it's all based on a story that, you know, if you pay people um, who, are, who are creating jobs more, they'll create more jobs. And that's, not just, not, that's just not the way we've seen things play out. 
we see that those with who have got a lot of capital to invest um, do invest it, and yes, you'll get some jobs out of that. But then, you know, that the rich are getting richer, and the and the poor getting poorer, and the, the and the gap is just widening. And it is, get, yeah. And nobody's better off from it. No, no. <laughs> and I think, you know, I'd hazard a guess that a lot of the a lot of the super rich aren't actually that happy. <laughs> That's actually been um, identified. Mm. Yeah, right. yep. That that has, they've done studies on that about where peak income and happiness um, collide, and it's yes, yeah, it's, it's about for Americans, it's a little over a hundred thousand dollars a year in annual income, and after that, it's sort of the happiness plateaus. We have a we have a woman in our town. I won't say too much because it's a little bit uh, not that flattering. Anyway, she uh, drives around on a brand new two door Rolls Royce. And um, she's Botoxed up, and she's often at the next door real estate company buying more real estate. Mm. And I look at her and think, you poor woman, mm. how much is enough? Yeah. You know, and, and I often look at her, and I really feel really sorry for her, mm. because Gosh. I know a little bit to know that she's as miserable as hell. Yeah. Yeah, and she's got her own personal stories about what she thinks constitutes success, and it's narratives that have been fed to her from the media and from, possibly from, you know, her her parents or people whatever. around her growing up. It doesn't whatever it might be. It's all stories that we've been that we've been told. And my my thesis in this book is that many of the narratives that we don't question day to day are leading us down the wrong path, and they've been doing that for a number of decades, really now. Um, and it is through changing those stories and adopting better narratives and you know there's a, there's a piece around imagining a better future imagining the thing, the way that things could be and telling that story and working backwards from there rather than forecasting what's going to happen and responding to it and that came through you know for me this time to imagine mm. right Rather than strategic plans and spreadsheets and so forth, actually giving yourself the space to imagine yeah. what is possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes you need to slow down to speed up. <laughs> Says Alina, speaking very quickly. <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? Hey, I went for a walk up Mount Vic this morning. And okay. And, and I walked no. here today. Yes. I, yep. and I did get lost, though. I, got, I went to the wrong door. Anyway, <laughs> the, the Alina, this piece that came through loud and clear in the book is that so many things are not that black and white mm. and as the as the world becomes more I mean we're seeing it right now this is interviews being done in November of 2021 and we are trying to get the country vaccinated and people are desperate to be absolutely clear what is going on. And we're not achieving that at the moment. We don't know exactly what's going on. Are we winning? Are we losing? Mm. Is the country becoming communist? Is it, There's all sorts of stuff starting to squeak out of the mm-hmm. edges now. And people are feeling really uncomfortable. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There's all sorts of narratives, really, about <laughs> what is what is happening. Yeah. And those are stories, you know, about... Uh, uh, yeah, what I see, what I see happening there is people are trying to find something that makes sense in an incredibly chaotic world right now. Between the the pandemic and climate change, we've got you know the world's leaders at Glasgow right now at COP twenty six, and in a few days' time they're going to be making announcements or not about what they have or haven't achieved. Um, <clears throat> and people are just trying to make sense of everything. And, um, and you know, sometimes there isn't any clear answers, but we jump towards, you know... Certainty. S- certainty and something that, that provides us a little bit of comfort in, in such a chaotic time. And that's where I see, you know, possibly some of these um, these misinformation campaigns are, are thriving on people who, you know, have, have been... Um, you know, are distrustful of authority, and and many of them rightfully so. Um, and people who you know are, are craving some something to make sense 
in a world that's not making sense. And we, we as human beings, we tend to, you know, we, we're not very good about thinking in complexity, in terms of complexity. We think very linearly a lot of the time. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're already distrustful and um, you've got everybody around you in your community, people who you love and respect, um, believing this this thing, then it's it's not a hard jump to, you know. And so if we taught our kids about complexity, because mm. I was just thinking about that at school, right? You went to school and you got exams and you were supposed to give the answers to what the teachers wanted, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and if you gave them the answers they wanted, they gave you a good mark. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking it would be wonderful to go back to school and go to an exam and go, well... There's this, there's this angle here. There's this story here that was told mm-hmm. that King Arthur was whatever. But there's another story. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? It would be very interesting. Yep. And what sort of mark would you get? <laughs> well, we'd have to entirely redefine or reimagine our education system, um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad idea. <laughs> Definitely time for an overhaul. Um, <clears throat> particularly in the times we're living in where things are moving and changing so quickly in the world and technology in the way that we eat, the way that we communicate with each other, um, online connectivity and all of that. So um, certainly I think there's there's a lot to be said for teaching young children about thinking about things critically and that there aren't right or wrong answers. There might be the answer that the teacher's looking for, um, but you know, it's um, it's all contextual. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> you've got maths and physics. Sure, there's a right answer there, right? It's laws of laws of physics, laws of nature. Sure, but if you're talking about anything sort of from you know history, you know English, those sorts of subjects, there's of course multiple things that can be true at once. And I was going to say, with nature, is so complex that the answers can be so varied. Yeah. With one tiny little difference here or there, mm-hmm. the outcome's quite different. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm just smiling to myself here thinking, you know, if I had my time back at school, it'd be just uh-huh. wonderful to go, well, you know, um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's answer this half a dozen different ways. The, the thing that I reflected on through the book, Alina, was that you were the class clown, you know, mm. a naughty girl, you liked, and... I reflected with that, and I thought, I thought uh, that was the other piece that I was smiling with myself that we're more alike than I realised. <laughs> and I saw a huge amount of maturing through the book, mm. through your life, going from the class clown to honing your skills to tell stories, and maybe transitioning from a rabid. Um, environmentalist to a polished environmentalist. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been called polished in my life. I'd well, there you go. Let's count give them that on two go. hands. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly I was, um, <clears throat> as, it, you, as you see, a rabid environmentalist. Um, I I engaged in my 20s in every sort of protest that came along, and that was a big part of my identity, is, is standing up and fighting um, for the injustices that I saw on social and environmental issues. Um, and now, I guess, uh, you know, that that comes along with the gifts of ageing for for most of us anyway, is, is you become a little bit more nuanced in your views. But certainly for me... Um, Spending time in the Edmund Hillary Fellowship community and just seeing the plethora of different ways that different fellows are approaching the social and environmental and economic problems that they're looking to solve, um, and and that for those that aren't familiar with the EHF, it's you know it's all people who are driven to make some kind of positive impact in the world, and some of them are entrepreneurs, quite traditional you know, Silicon Valley types. Some of them are grassroots activists. We've got filmmakers, journalists, farmers, all sorts of people in there with who all have different theories of change. And it was through spending a lot of time with that community and realising that, you know, somebody who I might have been tempted to put in a box and say, you know, they are the enemy or they're part of the problem, 
in my, you know, 10 years ago, um, is now someone who I can see, well, you know, they, I, they're not doing things the way that I would do it, but they're working with their skill set, their knowledge, their particular story, their view of the world to change things the way that they see fit. And, yeah, I can just be a little more tolerant, I guess, of the different ways that people are doing things. And I think that makes me um, a more effective change agent. And that's not to say, I want to be clear on this, that's not to say that there isn't a time for protest and direct action. Mm. You know, sometimes voices have to be heard, and that's the only way you're going to shift governments. Um, but with a lot of the day-to-day work that I'm doing, I'm 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 taking a much more nuanced view of things and realizing that you know things aren't black and white and um it's a theme in the book but just becoming comfortable with paradox and ambiguity i think is a muscle that we sorely need to flex together as a collective society and becoming you know a a little more okay with with not knowing something or with the the realization that multiple things might be true at once And I'll reflect on if we had met 30 years ago, Mm. I don't think I would have liked you. Well, I would have been 10. Oh, sorry. That's a bit mean of you, half. I would have been that class okay. clown that okay. you were. Okay. That. Okay. Well, I would have liked that. Okay. Sorry. I forgot you're so young. If I met you, let's say, all right. Oh, 15, God. 20 years ago, I said ago, to you, maybe. we don't edit this. Well, fuck, we might edit this one. <laughs> Thank you, I'm a 10-year-old. If I met you 15 years ago, I might have been, I was on a different journey then. Mm. What were you doing 15 years I ago? I was farming. Okay, yep. Right? Mm-hmm. And an environmental activist was just a real pain in the ass. Yep. Right? We were, we, we yep. were doing just great and piss off and we're just fine. We, you know, yeah. we know about the yeah. Yep. And certainly environmental protests, you just... I did. I encountered them once. I encountered them here. Mm-hmm. You might have been there. <laughs> I wasn't here 15 years ago. Okay, so that's I good. Was, I that's was busy good. waving signs yeah. in the Canadian prairies. <laughs> yeah, so that that was... Um, and I just, isn't that interesting, That how much, how far that you and I have come as a result of that? Mm-hmm. That we've been nice so far mm-hmm. to each other. So far. So... <laughs> Could be a short podcast, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's 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 the, a lot of the views that I had back then have absolutely changed, hmm. and just going, oh, there's something to this. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's not a, it's not necessarily that I think I was wrong back then. It's just that I thought I was very narrow minded about things. You know, I I came to a realization at one point that a lot of the people that I was surrounded with um, were more interested in being seen to be right and winning a particular campaign than making genuine, lasting, systemic change. Right. Because that's the much harder thing to do, right? It's it's easy to, to get a win on the scoreboard. It's much harder to shift these big systems upon which our lives are built. And um, so I looked around me and thought, oh, you know, these people are more interested in being right. You know, there's a lot of self-righteousness here. And then I realized, oh, holy shit, I am one of those people. <laughs> And, um, was that a, was that a thought that came over a long period, a gradual thing? It was a it was a gradual thing. You know, there wasn't an epiphany moment, but certainly I started looking back and going, oh, yeah, I was very dogged and you know, dogmatic in my in my views about how things should be and how how change comes about. I like being dogmatic. <laughs> it, you know, I I was so dogmatic in a previous world. Right, I was just. Loved it, loved it. It could be just, fun from time to time. Well, I just used it all the time. I was so fucking right <laughs> about stuff, and you know, I yeah. and I look back and go, "Oh, you dick!" <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just going, "Oh, yeah. some of the shit I believe." You know, I was anti. I, I was pro the the Springbok tour, right? Right. I was busy being born, and and I'm just like <laughs> during the Springbok tour. And I'm just like. Yeah, so you weren't protesting then. No, <laughs> uh, and you know, but I and I look back and went, "Oh my God, I was I was pro that tour." Yeah, yeah. You know? And yep. go, what was I thinking? Well, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking. Yeah. Well, that's I mean that's part of the the beauty of of realizing that our stories 
of our of ourselves in the past need not inform our stories of the future. They'll be they'll be part of our history, you know. But we can rewrite our stories toward the future and choose a different different path. And that's something that I've done myself in, in a couple of examples in the book. Which comes back to the title of the book, A Future Untold, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which means to you what? It means to me that, you know, the, the future that we've been sold, the future that, you know, shit's getting worse every year, climate change is getting worse, inequality is getting worse, um, is is one that we've been handed. And to me, it's it's like... You know, you know. In my more cynical moments, it's like the future's already been written for us. Whereas with this book, I'm trying to encourage people to see that the future is yet untold. We can choose to tell a different story into the future. And and there was a quote that I came across. I don't know who said it, but um, it's not so much that we tell stories; it's that stories tell us. Stories build our reality, right? So the stories that we tell day to day reflect back at us, they mirror back at us, and they create the kind of societies, economies, food systems, education systems, governance systems that we see around us every day. It's all built on stories. Goodness, I've made Harv silent. Ah. (laughs) I work with a wonderful woman, Mary Beth Robles, uh, for a few years with Collective Intelligence and and every now and then I'd come out with something quite profound. And she'd go, or not. Yeah. It was stunning. <laughs> Just, I'd go, what? Yeah. Like, yep. Or not. <laughs> exactly. Or not. <laughs> yep. And it took me a wee while to cope with this. And uh-huh. I realised that whenever she said, or not, mm. it was always done very kindly. Mm. It was a signal to go... Yep, that's your story. That's the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and we use this in the office from time to time when we're not. I used it recently with somebody at work. And I said, oh, this is a story I'm telling myself at the moment. Mm. And it made it so much more. It's a Brenna Brown thing. It made it so much easier to broach the subject of the, that I was pissed off about something. And yeah. I went, this is the story I'm telling myself. Yep. And it was to Karen in the office, and she just laughed, Mm -hmm. you know, laughed at my story. Yep. And we all tell stories to ourselves. I mean, we we justify everything that we think and believe um, through through story and there's a there's a focus in my book as you said on on black and white thinking and us versus them and you know um, trying to understand these these crazy these stupid ignorant people that you know that you don't agree with or whoever it might be. And realizing that you know they just they have different world points, and you don't need to agree with them or condone, condone their behaviour for those that you know are violent or um, extreme towards others because of their views. But they all subscribe to a narrative of themselves as the good guys. Yeah, um, yeah, and that, that, that there's some villain to overcome. And we've been fed that story since we were you know knee high to a grasshopper. There's heroes and villains. I think I'm always a good guy. Yeah, exactly. That's my point. Yep. And just to let you know, I am the good guy, Alina, in my stories. Okay. Yeah. And I was thinking, I don't know, do we ever tell the story where we're... Yeah. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How that... Yeah. Is that something that is natural? Is that, a, is that something that we're taught to do? Well, I mean... Naturally, we, you know, when I talk about the hero's journey and my problems with it in this book, uh, the hero's journey arc, and um, it being narrow and singular focused on on one particular person, whereas I think to solve a lot of the problems that we've got as a society, we need to think in much more collectivist ways rather than individualist ways. But the, the hero's journey narrative is all about you know the individual and the transformation of the individual, and there might be other characters along the way that help this one person, but it's a it's a deeply individual story, and you're given that. <clears throat> You know, from from when you're watching cartoons as a kid, you know, there's the 
there's the hero and there's the villain and my my son is five and but he was you know when he was three already he could tell me who was the bad guy and who was the good guy and we've had lots of conversations around you know the fact that in the real world there very rarely are such things as bad guys or bad people there are people who do bad things and that's an important distinction. Which is a behaviour. It doesn't make them bad. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a behaviour, not a state of being. Yeah. And it's interesting when you hear that, you know, there was some conversation yesterday. There was a judge talking about uh, some changes he wants to bring about. And I hear the cries of people going, oh, we're getting soft. And, mm. you know, we need to stamp down on the gangs. And yeah. and I've read a couple of books this year on, on the gangs in New Zealand and two totally different backgrounds. One was a PhD and... One was a journalist. And it's quite apparent that stamping down on gangs has had the opposite effect yeah. all the way along. It's never, ever worked. Well, of course. Because in their narrative, you know, the state has always been against them. You know, a lot of a lot of people in gangs have had very broken childhoods. They've gone through the state system. They've been let down by the state. They've been abused, some of them, by the state. So why would we think that another attack by the state <laughs> would help these people to, um, you know, reconcile come on board, and come, on, come board. on board and turn their lives around. The, the the whole narrative that they have of their existence in their world is that everyone's always been against them. And suddenly you find a band of people that say, come on, you could be one of us. You have community here, you know. Uh, what would you do? And, and look, in these books, it was wonderful to see that politicians would come out, John Banks was one of them, that he was going to come out and get tough on gangs. Mm -hmm. And you just smile and go, the gangs have had a lot tougher life than most politicians and go, toughen it up, go and play their game. And the gangs would go, yeah, this is why we're in gangs. You bastards don't like us. Yeah, go and talk to them, you know. (laughs) Have a chat, have a cup of tea and a chat. (laughs) Alina, I was asked yesterday about leadership and I, and I'm, what sparked this is your term about collective before. And I said, I don't believe in leadership. Mm-hmm. And they said, what do you believe in? I said, I believe in groups of diverse people working on complex stuff. I don't think anybody knows the thing. Mm. Jacinda doesn't know the thing. No. Nobody knows the thing. And... We know from our work at Collective Intelligence that the more diverse the team is, the more able they are to cut through complexity and handle ambiguity because they all come from different angles. Yep. And you go, well, that's not, that's not quite right. Mm. And I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and you've got to be really quite flexible to cope with that, don't you? You need yes. to be, you know. Yep. Yeah, you do. It's a, it's, and it's a learned thing, right? Um, just because you've been quite dogmatic about something in the past doesn't mean that you can't be open to um, sitting with that discomfort that you feel and going, oh, it's okay, actually, for me to be uncomfortable and, and for me not to agree with this person over there. I'm still going to be respectful and listen to them. Yeah, I struggle with that sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I just go... Uh, yeah, okay, you know, keep listening. Because the interesting thing is the is the discomfort is often the gold, isn't it? Mm, yeah. If you can explore. Oh that. yes. Yeah. How do you how do you do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I tend to find myself in uncomfortable situations a lot. <laughs> Just always, you know, if something's intriguing to me, um, and I'm feeling a little bit like, oh, should I do that? I know that's probably a good sign that I probably should, you know. Um, I'm continually pu- pushing myself out of my comfort zone because, I, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm a, I'm a personal growth junkie. I just, I, I love, you know, learning things. I love, um, yeah, expanding sort of my horizons and th- of, of what, what is possible and the different ways that people are. It's quite funny, actually, because I studied, I studied physical geography at university. And um, at the time, I thought human geography, the study of human geography, which is anth- anthropology of, of cities and, and, and so on and spaces, um, <clears throat> I thought that was just a load of bollocks. I was just like, oh, this is such woo-woo rubbish. And now, looking back, I think if I was studying geography again, I would be much more drawn to 
to the the human elements of it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I still I still love, you know, volcanoes and geomorphology and all of that stuff. all of that fun stuff. But um but certainly I'd be I'd be more interested and more open to um human systems. And I mean in part in this book I've become somewhat of an amateur psychologist because you know, I do go into some some bits of psychology in there and I've never studied psychology, but it's stuff that I've picked up along the way in terms of our biases, our our um intrinsic behaviors that we have. One of the things that comes across in the book, though, Alina, is you've done a lot of reading, a lot of research. You know, that's that's peppered all through the book. Mm. And, um, you know, it's interesting that at, at no stage do I think Alina doesn't know what she's talking about. You know, there seemed right. to be a basis there yep. for your thoughts, right? And mm. so if we're not worried whether they're right or wrong, that is the story, yep. Alina's story. I thought they are well-founded stories. Yeah. yeah. So that came across that... You are obviously this junkie to absorb stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I am. And I mean, you know, the the book is well researched uh, where it needs to be, but I was very clear from the get go that I did not want to write a boring how to manual. It's a book full of stories, it's stories about storytelling, and there's, you know, there's anecdotes of mine all the way through. The book was going to be boring or it's going to be heavy. Mm. I haven't worked that out yet because, of course, when I started reading it, because I've seen you, I've seen your stuff, right? You write really well. Mm-hmm. You're a wonderful poet, mm. but for some reason, I had this bloody thing in my book, in my in my head, yep. that it was going to be hard work. I haven't worked that out. Maybe yet. because there's a million books out there on organisational storytelling and how to get your message across and how to tell the right story, and this isn't that book. If you're looking for a how-to manual on how to tell good stories, this isn't that book. This is a book that's more of a rallying cry for us to return to the power of story to change the systems that we find ourselves embedded within. Mm. Like a fish in water. We're just we're all we're all surrounded by these systems. Yeah. Um in the one of the last chapters you talk about what was that thing you saw? I'm just trying because I've had the same experience. When you looked at the history of the world, how long was it was, mm. the, and humans only been here two hundred thousand years. Yeah, on a planet that's been here for four point six billion years, which is a bit longer <laughs> than that. And we're just a wee blip at the end of that. We're a tiny blip. Yeah, right. and we've just turned up, and we might disappear very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that uh, in Toronto at the Science Centre there, and they had that in a long mural. Mm-hmm. It was maybe 100 metres long, yeah. and it was the history of the world, right? Yeah. Well, fuck all happens for a long time. The yes, mural, nothing. Because I didn't realise what, what it was. It was just this sort of dust and stuff. And, and and they did change the end of it. They expanded the end, and they said the scale is different because oh, see, if it yeah. was on a 100 metre it was like, oh, it was you walking, wasn't it? And listening to the yeah. Well, the, the the example I give in the book, there's a there's an app out there called the Deep Time Walk, and I encourage um, yeah, our listeners to go and check that out. It's an app you can download, and it provides an audio narrative as you walk for four point six kilometers, and every hundred meters represents a hundred million years of the Earth's history and so as you're walking you know it's it's based on gps on your phone and all that but as you're walking you get told the story of what's happening and it is incredibly boring for the first you know three and a half four kilometers nothing's happening um and then yeah over that 4.6 kilometers it's only the last 20 centimeters 20 centimeters out of 4.6 kilometers that humans even enter the picture (laughs) And then, you know, if you look at the time of the Anthropocene, which we're in, in which, you know, we are changing the climate and destabilizing so many of our Earth systems, let's say, you know, let's be generous and say that's about a 250 years, you know, since we started um, coal, coal-fired stuff and steam engines and so on. Um, that's about the length of a dust mite. Yeah. A dust mite versus 4.6 kilometers of the Earth's history. So that it just puts it in context for you and goes... Wow, you know, we've really managed to mess things up in a big way. Really quickly. Really quickly. Yep. 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 (laughs) But, you know, because it's happened that quickly, we can change things quickly. If we tell a different story. If we tell a different story. 
And this is what I want, you know, our world leaders in Glasgow to hear. Is is you know, I've I've put out a new video, uh, a new poetry video this week about, you know, loosely on climate change and the the history of humanity, and that's in the book too, the Big World Small Planet Remix poem, and um, you know, that's what I that's what I want world leaders to see, is we can tell a different story, and just because each of these incremental blips so far has brought us to this point doesn't mean we need to continue. The last chapter talks about patriarchy, and uh, I had an experience of this recently with some chaps... It's the was, second to last, possibly. Is it? Yeah. Um, I'm great on detail. Uh, there was a piece... Uh, uh, so these chaps were talking about how they they dislike Greta Thunberg, right? And she was a, right. just a... She was a, uh-huh. she was a this and she was that and yeah. whatever, and I'm listening to this and I went, hey... I said, you know what, fellas, I, I, I've got a totally different... And Kate's, my wife, is teaching me to say, when I disagree with people, to smile. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't frown, because she yeah. said it's just... You know, so I smile, and I said, guys, you know, I totally disagree with that. I think she's got, you know... Mm-hmm. Uh, I said, do you like David Attenborough in his stories? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, do you realise... He's realize, a bloke. <laughs> well, do you, do you realise that they're saying exactly the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same thing mm-hmm. in a different way, mm-hmm. but because he's a good old bloke, yep. and she's a young upstart, feist, upstart bloody <laughs> you know teenage girl. Yep, I thought there it is, right there. There it is. Yeah. Exactly the same stories told in a different way. Yep, one from a patriarch, one from a young woman. Mm-hmm. I can listen to one. I can listen to the other. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. yeah, and I think she rubs so many of you know the, the establishment the wrong way because precisely because she is a young, outspoken woman who's just standing up and going, no, <laughs> you guys are absolutely wrong. And it'll be interesting to see her as she matures mm. and yeah. and see how that... And, you know, people are going, oh, she should go back to school and learn... Go, learn what? <laughs> she seems pretty well informed already. Yeah, she's pretty well informed. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but it was interesting just to see that difference between the two, um, mm-hmm. Elena. Yeah, because those old those people that you were talking to have their own stories, right? Yep. Their own narratives about whose voices matter, about who should get to stand up and speak around, you know, the 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 narratives of the economy, the narratives of growth, the, or, you know, all of these stories that we believe. Yep, and David Attenborough shouldn't go back to school. Because right, he's done school. No, he's ninety five right. now. They might yeah. not let him in. And and you know all that sort of stuff. But I thought it was such a really stark mm. example. Same message, different yeah. different backgrounds. Yeah, brilliantly done. Well Alina, done, right? you had some help with the cover from uh, the very um, talented Peter Roybant. I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Peter. And shout out to Peter. And your collective intelligence, I think, help maybe. Kick you along with this book? Yeah. Kick you along is possibly not the best mm. term. <laughs> well, you know, in the most loving way possible. Peter actually um, <clears throat> encouraged me in July last year when we met down in Castle Hill for another member's host day. Um, he um, encouraged me to go full time on the book. Um, and at that stage, I was. Um, doing some story consulting work and narrative work with organisations and I was doing some work telling regenerative agriculture stories with Pure Advantage and EHF and um, it was his encouragement that, that made me go, actually I've got to focus on this properly, you know, I've got to treat it like a job yep. and um, and so I did that from August last year and um, yeah, the rest of the team have been great in terms of just you know, I, I joined Collective Intelligence in February last year, that's when my first meeting was. And it was around the same time that I started writing the book. Right. So I've been writing the book the whole time, the whole, my whole journey through so far with um, with my team. And, um, and yeah, they've, they've been wonderfully supportive. Um, I had my host day recently and they um, – oh, I set my question as what's next for Alina after the book? And so – we all jammed around that. They talked to people from my life, and um, I still don't have a quest- the answer to that question. <laughs> I, I think it's unfolding slowly, 
and I'm not in a hurry. I'm doing a little bit of story consulting work and um, and narrative work and helping different organisations at the moment. Um, and so I'll I'll just continue. I think going along with that until um, I figure out what what this the solid next step is. It might be just continuing doing that. It might be um, some sort of a new organisation based around systems change. And I mean, as I wrote this book, I got very interested in the topic of polarisation and the way that we, you know, we have these narratives of other people that don't think like us. And um, I talk in there about this infographic that I've got on the wall. Of course, our listeners can't see it, but... I talk about it but in the book. Point to it anyway. Yes, yes, I'm still pointing anyway, so <laughs> half can see. Um, infographic on the wall that just displays um, it, our different values as a society, as a set of scales. And on one hand, you've got the left and the right, and of course, these are very generalised because you know there's very few people, except maybe in America, where <laughs> where they're completely left or completely right. Um, but it's um, it's all everybody has values and there's a lot of focus in the book on how people's beliefs are informed by the values that they hold most dear and um and that in turn informs their world views the way that they think things are or should be um which again is just a set of narratives so lena you know it's it's because when i read that i you know, part of the whole premise of collective intelligence is to put people together who do not think the same, mm. who do not have the same worldview. I hadn't thought of it from a values point of view mm. before, right? Yep. Because I think a lot of our members have the same values, but maybe they don't. Not necessarily. No. 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 And so is it okay to change your values? And before you answer that, what I'm thinking from that point of view is that values are very important to us. They sit behind mm. us and they, mm. they, they mould how we act even when we don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a good thing to have, mm. good thing to have values. Yeah. So how do we cope with changing or modifying our values without it destabilising us? Well, that's... A that's an interesting question because I think it, you know, to your original question, yes, it's okay to change your values. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, is it easy to change your values? No. It, you know, often these values are things that have been deeply embedded in us since childhood. They're the things that we learned in our upbringing. Um, and you know, they, they're the things that we subconsciously hold dear. Um, so, you know, I think if there's a change in your value set, it's something that will almost certainly happen gradually over time, rather than it um, it happening, you know, as some sort of strange, weird epiphany. And I think you know we we can hold opposing values, but we but whenever we're acting in a certain circumstance, and you know, and in, in we're dealing with a situation. Um, we can't live into both two values at the same time. And I use the example of, in the book, and it's just a, a frivolous example. and says that, you know, I value, um, I value loyalty. That's one of my values is loyalty. But another one of my values is, um, you know, seeking, seeking pleasure and, and enjoying my life to the fullest, enjoyment of life. And so if I have a hypothetical situation where, you know, an old friend asks me to come to their boring book launch <laughs> or presentation or whatever it is, and, um, you know, <laughs> and, and I don't really want to go, but I'm like, okay, well, you know, but they've done this thing and I should go. Or a new friend or acquaintance says, hey, you know, we're going out tonight, we're going to go see some glowworms in this, in this cool spot, you know, like, like. Ooh, that sounds fun, you know. <laughs> Which value do I prioritize? Do I prioritize the loyalty or do I prioritize the enjoying life and, you know, that hedonistic kind of, oh, I want to go have fun. Um, and so it's, it's very hard, you know, to, to, to live into two values at the same time. But we, might, but we might hold opposing values. And so that's, you know, that's okay. Um, 
and it's just it's our behaviour and what we choose to do at the time that. But what you're talking about there is also having the ability to be conscious, and I mm. believe that a lot of people out there are not conscious of what is going on for them. Absolutely. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> and it's just they respond to things without thinking, mm -hmm. what's going on here yeah. for me? Yeah. Yep. And we're not taught to question our stories or, or our motivations or actions growing up. We're taught that, you know... Again, coming back to the hero versus villain story, that, that you're the right one and our current social media environment and, you know, the rise of the alt-right and polarisation and, and you know, the left becoming lefter and the right becoming writer and and all of that is, is very much rooted in that narrative of, well, oh, but if I'm right and, you know, heaven forbid that I might be wrong, then that means that they must be wrong. And very soon I'm going to, which leads us on to a, a poem that you've written that I'm going to ask you to uh, recite for me. And it was, I asked Lena when she joined Collective Intelligence whether one day that she would write a poem for us, for Collective Intelligence. And then I realised only six weeks later that it was already written. <laughs> and you had, I had, saw your clip that you had recited this poem mm. at the fellowship at the, the new retreat, frontiers new yeah. frontiers mm. and uh and i have read that poem out this year we have an annual get together for poets and i read that out this year and it's what was interesting for me to recite the poem is i got to halfway and i needed a break <laughs> Right, <laughs> and and people thought the poem was finished, but it wasn't. It was only halfway through. Yeah, and it was just stopping just intermission, and, and just and then I went, oh, hang on, I haven't finished yet, and it was a wonderful feeling, just going, oof, mm. yeah, let that sit for a minute yeah. before you continue. Before you continue, <laughs> and it's something that. So coming back to the conscious thing, Alina, that. There is so much noise out in the world today. How do we encourage people to work out before we go and check out what's going on over there, mm. checking out what's going on in here, inside mm. us first? Yep. How do we encourage people to do that? Oh, that's the million-dollar question. Um, I think just you know, encouraging people to question where that belief is coming from. Um, and question what what kind of, you know, coming back to values, what's the value that I want to um, demonstrate or illustrate here with this interaction with this person? You know, do I, is it more important for me to be right or is it more important for me to be compassionate, if that's something that I think is one of my values? And um, it's it's difficult because... We live in a fast-paced world. There's lots happening. We all have so many responsibilities. We have so many things on our plate. We don't always necessarily have the time to, and the luxury to sit back and go, oh, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll be patient with this person because patience is one of my values. You know, it, we're all very reactionary in this very fast-paced yeah. life that we live in. And, I mean, it, it, it'll... It'll vary person to person, but for myself, I find running in the bush helps, meditating helps, um, having downtime, having little rituals that I go through, um, and that's one of—I mean—that's one of the chapters in the book. Is one of the new myths is that we we, in some ways, need to move from being um, what what we've become to be as human human doings, rather than human beings. Yep. We need to move back to actually be human beings, and and sometimes just sit and be rather than always be doing, 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 doing things. And that's where a lot, for me, of the insight comes from, is those times of quiet. One of the things, I've just opened the book, um, one of the things I loved at the beginning of some of the chapters, I think it was at the end, yeah, mm. the end chapters, you just go, here's the current narrative, Yep. right? Mm -hmm. We need to be constantly busy and more productive to be successful and get ahead in life. Yep. 
That's, to a that's, new, the, human, that's the human doing narrative. Yep, yep. Right, so that's the current narrative. Yep. To a new myth, there are times for doing and times for not doing. Yeah, simple as that. <laughs> and you go, we can change the myth, we can change the narrative. We can, yeah. yeah. Yep, and just need to be conscious of it. That's the, that's the key, is that in those, those final ten chapters, which are the ten new myths for humanity... I do. I, out, I outline the current narrative by which I'm ho- hoping to help make people conscious of, oh, yeah, this is a narrative that sits under my behaviours, um, and here's a new myth. And I use that word, you know, from a place of, of reclaiming it, a, a place that, you know, a thesis that myth is a good thing that can help us shift this narrative. I've brought this up before, and I'm modifying this response all the time. Um uh, one of my pet hates is people say, uh, are you busy? Uh, it's just a, hello, are you busy? Like when they call you up? No, something. if you see somebody... Uh, oh, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, no, they'll, it'll be a question. Oh, okay. So this, this um, uh, I'll get it, and um, you haven't seen somebody for a while, and you go to the coffee cart, oh, um, uh, are you busy today? Or uh, are you busy? You know, right. And it's just... And it's like, it just does my head in, right? <laughs> and the reason, and so my response is, it used to be, I work too fucking hard to be busy because I hate being busy, right? right? But I'm changing that now to going, no, I'm, I, I am working to be more conscious so I'm not busy. Mm. right? Because before it was just a yep. pushback, right? It was just go, yeah. you're wrong, right? And <laughs> stop asking that question because you're annoying me, right? Yeah. And so I'm trying to be more generous in my response. But to go, mm. you know, this busy thing, mm. it's not good. No. You know? No, it's, it's not, not. good. Because no. when I get busy, I just yeah. do more shit I don't want to do. Yeah. Right? Rather yeah. than going, what's important? Mm-hmm. What should I be doing? Yeah. Right? It's yeah. quite different. Yeah. And so much of our, you know, quote, unquote, productive time is not actually something that we really need to be doing. Or, That's right. you know, we spend, we spend so much time doing things that just are, are not helping us achieve what it is that we actually want to do. Um, it's just noise. It's just noise. Mm. Yep. And then at the end of the week, we're really tired. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and once upon a time, I would have come down here the night, this morning. Mm. I would have driven down this morning. Right. And got here. But I came down last night. Mm. And yep. uh, I did less. Yeah. So I drove down after work got down here and I walked here this morning mm. looking forward you know and it's just creating more space yep yeah right? and it's subtle things make a big difference yeah. to me yep yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely and you know I've I've struggled to hold down a regular meditation practice where I sit and close my eyes quietly you know and so one of the ways that I've weaved it into my life is that I no longer well, I used to listen to music or podcasts a lot when I was walking somewhere, or you know, or I'd be on my phone doing, a, you know, send a couple of emails while I'm on the bus or walking somewhere or whatever. Um, and now I, I consciously make my, you know, my transit time walking or or busing, I make it meditation time, and 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 by that I mean I look around at everything, I listen to the noises, I try not to think or plan about where I'm going or what's next. And I just try to notice every single detail of, of what's going on around me. And it's made a world of difference. And I mean, that I, I also read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle earlier this year, and that helped, or well, it was last year actually, and that helped hugely with reminding myself that actually the past is just a projection, a bunch of stories. The history, uh, the, the future rather, is also a projection at this stage, it's stories about what might be, and all that actually exists is now. Mm. And the thing I loved about the book, Alina, is it gave me. There's some heavy subjects in there, there's some big subjects in there, but they didn't weigh me down. Mm. They gave me hope. Yep. And I thought. I'm allowed to write whatever story I want. Alina, we're going to quietly wrap this up soon and, and we are going to 
Uh, I hope you haven't changed your mind. Uh, I'd love you to recite, uh, recite that poem. I'll my favourite poem. Not of yours, it's my favourite poem because I think it's so <laughs> poignant in today's world. Hmm. Um, what, what have we not covered in the book that you'd like to cover uh, in this conversation? Hmm. There's a lot in there. Um, but I think something that's really important that we don't give a lot of thought to is that <clears throat> there's storytelling. But in order for a story to um, actually land with an audience, you need also to have a practice of story listening or active listening or authentic listening. Um, and that's the, the yin to the yang of storytelling, really, is that um, we're not... We're not well versed in general at sitting and quietly listening to somebody and not already be formulating a response in your head to that story or comparing that story to a similar story that you've heard and therefore reaching the same conclusions about that person as the other person who told that story. Um, and we, we're not very good at just letting a story be. We're always looking for the lesson or the or the, the aha moment or the epiphany or, or whatever it might be. And some stories have those, and that's great. And other stories don't, and they're equally legitimate. And so there's a, the whole chapter in the book around the subtle art of story listening and, um, and how we can become more aware of just listening when somebody's telling a story. And it doesn't need to be what we traditionally think of as a story, as in, you know, here's a beginning, middle, end with a protagonist and and so on. Um, <clears throat> whenever they're saying something about themselves or their own truth or, or whatever it might be, just listening and and letting that land and 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 waiting and and letting the story be and just seeing seeing what comes out of it. And, when it's your turn to talk, by all means, then you know you formulate your response and talk. But we're <clears throat> we're very bad at that in this day and age. We don't we don't often listen to what actually is being said. We um, we formulate some sort of a knee jerk reaction to the general theme of it, or something something that they said in there. You you catch onto that one bit and and refute it, or and that comes down again to our um, our propensity towards. Um, dualistic thinking and that there's there's only like right or wrong or one or the other um and our our discomfort with paradox and um so i think yeah i mean it's it's certainly a a, a muscle that we need to flex is becoming better at listening to each other who's your favorite listener oh wow <laughs> it's definitely not my children <laughs> <laughs> who's my favorite listener Probably my friend Katie. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, she's you know she's well versed in this in this kind of thing and just deeply listening to you when you've got something that you want to say, rather than you know jumping in and saying either supporting you or or refuting you. You know, because that's the other thing that we do is is that when somebody's saying something or telling a difficult story, is that you know. We sit there in discomfort and we're like, oh, I want to let them know that I, that I agree with them or that I support them. So we're like, yeah, or totally, or, you know, you interject. And um, she doesn't. She just listens. It's a fascinating thing with facilitating hmm. that you know when a team is going really well when they don't say anything. Mm -hmm. When somebody is sharing something that's really crunchy, and they just sit there and don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And you go, look at that. This team yeah. is doing great work. Yep. And it's not something that you often see around the board table, you know, or in, in, in big meetings and organisational settings. There's very few spaces where there's just silence or people are contemplating what somebody's just said. Usually there's no break between one person talking and the next person jumping in and like, oh, it's my turn to talk. I want to tell my story now. A lovely story of Bettina when she joined Collective Intelligence and she came down to meet to Wellington to meet the facilitators. The facilitators were all coming together. Mary Beth was facilitating the meeting. She's a great facilitator. And uh, 
There was a conversation being had, and then nobody was talking. And Bettina said in her head, she was going, oh my God, am I sp- are they waiting for me? Should, what's, why is everybody quiet? And they were quiet for about 60 seconds. And she said it was 60 seconds of hell. Yeah. yeah. Because she thought mm-hmm. somebody had asked her a question that she had missed. Or was she supposed to be doing something? Yeah. It was fascinating. She said, yeah. I have never been to a, a meeting where people were so quiet. Because you'd think facilitators would all talk yeah. together. But they don't. Yeah. When you get a group of facilitators together... One will talk and everybody else listens. Yeah. And then there'll be silence. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. they're all listening and thinking and contemplating. Mm-hmm. And the meeting finished early. Yep. And Bettina's going, yeah. hang on, I don't, I just, we meditated at the beginning. Yeah. Before the meeting. Uh-huh. We had all these silences mm-hmm. and we finished early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's she just like, it yeah. doesn't make sense. <laughs> Yeah, one of my one of my favourite authors and, and someone who's been a huge inspiration to me for this book and there's a lot of overlapping themes with his work is Charles Eisenstein. Um and he's a brilliant, brilliant thinker on you know, my favourite book of his is called The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Um Alina's pointing again. You're so good at this podcast, Lena Alina. <laughs> Wait till I get going with my poem, I'll be gesturing all over the place. Um and he you know, he regularly, you'll see him being interviewed, he will pause mid-thought or, you know, after somebody's asked him a question for, you know, 30, 45 seconds, thinking about what he wants to say to the point where the audience is like, you know, is he all right? Is he having a stroke? Is he, you know, what's, what's happening here? And he's just thinking. And he makes no apology for the fact that he's like, I want to think about what I want to say before I answer. Just because I was mid-flow in a sentence doesn't mean I need to finish that train of thought if I think I want to go somewhere else. And he'll just stop and think until he's ready and he knows exactly what he wants to say. And I think it's brilliant. (laughs) It's highly uncomfortable for people in the audience because they're thinking, oh, what's going on here? Is there something wrong? But it's like, no. Interesting. He's just thinking about what he wants to say. I had a conversation with a chap recently and he was all over the place and he talked for about 15 minutes. And I said, I have no idea what you've been talking about because it just sounds like noise to me. <laughs> yeah. What's really going on? Yeah. Yep. And he's like, oh. Just okay. filling the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. He thought, if I talk long enough, this call will finish and I don't have to talk about what's really going on. <laughs> But I did have to really listen to him and going, there's nothing going on here. This is just noise. <laughs> yeah. And then when he told me what was really going on, I said, Cole, why didn't we have that conversation before? Mm. And he said, because I'm too uncomfortable with it. Yeah. I said, okay, got that. My favourite listener is Arne Kikuru. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's a good talker too. Oh, we won't give him too much credit. <laughs> We we'll edit that out. No, but we we'll edit that. He is a he is a and you know the thing is that you only get he he only says one thing once and he doesn't remember what he said mm. and then the next time you know yeah you just get one draft of everything like that. and it and it hits the it hits the nail on the head he's brilliant yeah but but you couldn't yeah and then it's it gone again. yeah and then it's gone mm-hmm. um, but the thing I love about Anarchy is that he will physically listen. Like you can see him moving, mm. and you know he's, you know, it's wonderful to see him go. Yeah, yeah, I've seen him in a in a, yep. in a group of people, and you just see him. That really person is a hundred percent there. Hundred yep. percent, and it's mm-hmm. just such a wonderful thing to see. It is. It's a yeah. wonderful gift to the person that you're talking to, yeah. and for yourself because then you actually get to <laughs> you get to experience the actual thing. Alina. Is it okay if I video you? <coughs> to do the poem? Yeah. Like, we'll do both. My manky no, old you're looking, and... you're looking glam, I know. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so not glam. But uh, okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Shall we give that a go? All right. Are we going to do it in front of this microphone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to go on the podcast, and I'm going to do, I'm going to be multilingual, and I'm going to video it. I'm going to try and video it. Okay. Okay? Okay. But 
But you know, just thinking about backdrops and like. Oh, stop being a dick. You're a poet, not a bloody fashion designer. <laughs> just okay. be a poet. Just be a poet with all my children's mess before we, me. <laughs> No, it's, ch- it's just children's stuff. Alina, seriously, um, before we do this, because I'm going to wrap up at, at the end of this poem, because I'm going to be... It's going to be done. All right. Okay. It's been a so pleasure before, to talk. Oh, look, I've loved it, and I, I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed my homework, and yes. it was, wasn't homework at all. It was a yep. fabulous book, and I think the book is so right for our times right now, and I'd, I would encourage people to read it because it's uh, it's a great way to give us the ability to be in this messy time that we're in now because it's not going to get unmessy anytime soon no it's not no and so Alina congratulations on the book well done I really enjoyed it thank you thank you and to anybody who's listening it's a a future untold the power of story to transform the world and ourselves available on all major platforms online Amazon Barnes and Noble and And to buy a hard copy to buy a hard copy um, at the moment is a bit difficult because I did self-publish and uh, so I haven't got a distributor for New Zealand. Um, but, yeah, good books in Wellington are stocking it. Yep. Um, are they able to contact you to, to, to buy more? To yep. buy more? Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. So we'll put that link at the bottom of this. Yep. Um, or else, um, I mean, you can you can order it online to, to deliver and it'll print on demand as well. Yep. Um, Fish Pond have got it. For New Zealand delivery, Amazon delivered to New Zealand. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I hate to support Amazon, but I do need the reviews and the and the sales on there too yep. to make this thing go wide. So yep. it's a double edged sword, Amazon. The and I would really recommend this for holiday reading because it's going to give you more ability to get through twenty twenty two. I believe. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a good. It's a good guidebook, and it's. And I mean, it's ultimately inspiring and hopeful. You know, I really tried not to make it a doom and gloom book. It's a book about solving big, complex issues. You know, the biggest problems that our world is facing, but it's full of hope. And you know, I've made it funny in places, and you know, I think I think people will enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I certainly did. Awesome. Okay, Elena. Let's do this thing. I'm really excited about this because, and I'll tell you why, because I've never seen this live before. I've seen you, right? <laughs> yeah, and, now I get, and now I get it live. Okay? Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Alina Siegfried. If we are to believe the stories that dominate our social media feed... There are an evil group of people out there who are out to destroy our lives. They do not share our values. They have no common sense. They will take away your freedom, bombard you with fake news. Brainwashing your children with their propaganda, they will do everything in their power to take away all that you hold sacred. Beware. They are out there. The people we call them. Them, the enemy. Them, those other ones. Them, the ones we must overcome, the target of every comment section everywhere. So confident are we that we are the ones who are right. We have turned respectful public debate into millions of miniature individual dictatorships of the mind. The teeth of our savage sound bites grow ever sharper by the day, while indignant ears remain deaf to anything that does not reinforce our worldview. There is no room for reason in a lynch mob, no longer a gift in give and take, no space for context and complexity in a 280 character tweet. The air is growing thin in this here echo chamber, it's getting harder and harder to breathe. We need not even look too far before we can identify a them. Even amongst brothers and sisters in arms, sibling rivalry cuts deep. The climate activist questions the urgency of queer rights if we have no habitable planet to call our home. The unionist challenges foreign aid when a working wage can't even feed our own people. 
we hear it's the immigrants who are the problem. Or those people in SUVs. No, it's the dairy farmers, the greenies, the feminists, the turfs, the bankers, the church, the NRA. It's corporate welfare, guerrilla warfare. It's the liberal media, the gay agenda. It's them, it's they, it's those people. If only they would stop. Listen. Can you hear that? That is the sound of singular stories. It is the sound of petty distractions. It is the sound of red herrings gasping for breath as the future slips away. Oblivious to our own hypocrisy and wasting our precious energy, we are setting ourselves on fire in the hopes that they will die of smoke inhalation. It need not be this way. We can be better than this. We have the cure for them. It's simple. It is us. What if we took our pointing fingers and we turned them upside down to extend the gentle hand of compromise? Offered up our gifts and contributions with open hearts, embracing grace and humility. That's not to say that we should deny the role of privilege, ignore the wounds from the past, or cease to pursue our passion for change. After all, even the Buddha taught non-violence, not pacifism. But let us dismantle systems of oppression without creating carbon copies addressed to them. Respect. (coughs) No. (laughs) Shit. Step away from the militancy you have held so close as a lover. Soften your heart and walk a mile in shoes that do not fit. Shoes that cause you discomfort. Blisters edging their way in beneath the soles of the feet you have so firmly planted into the arguments you've convinced yourself are solid. This place is familiar. It is comfortable. But we desperately need to stand upon common ground. For it is there that we can pinpoint the underlying causes behind our addiction to outrage. Feelings of grief of losing that which we hold there. Feelings of fear of those who we do not understand. Feelings of pain of leaning into the despair of not knowing how the hell we are going to dig ourselves out of this mess. Respect the collective wisdom that comes from listening to many voices that are different from your own. Find your passion and then you do you and do it well while simultaneously seeking to respect and understand why it is that they care so deeply about something else. According to particle physics, we exchange 98% of the atoms in our body with the world around us every year. So I am you, and you are me. And they are us, and we are them We are them. We are them. To somebody, somewhere, you are them. Bravo. (laughs) (sighs) Well, you can edit that little fuck up out of the poem. (laughs) I won't do that. (laughs) <laughs> and the wonderful thing is we're still recording, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Alina, mm. that was such a privilege to have that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And You're welcome. I love that poem. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Half. And good luck for the pieces that are next, whatever that might be. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you. You've just been listening to an episode of Stuff That Matters Now brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I hope you enjoyed listening to the fun stuff, the rugged stuff and the complete stuff up that have helped this particular collective intelligence member evolve while making the world a better place. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. Contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you Evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.